Okay, let's go over ECG case number 13 here. Well, quite a few we've done so far. Uh, you respond to a 60-year-old male. He's complaining of chest pain and some shortness of breath. He states that his chest is tight and he feels worse with deep inspiration. He has been coughing, pink sputum, and this began in the middle of the night. So this tells us a little bit. Um, the chest pain, is, you know, it's a little bit atypical for cardiac. Usually cardiac's more the pressure. This feels tight and it's worse with deep inspiration. So it tells you it may be a, a little bit pleuritic, in, in the type of pain. You still gotta do squall bleed and you still gotta, you know, treat as possible ca cardiac patient. And he tells you he's been coughing up pink sputum. So the cough itself could be causing a little bit of chest pain. And the pink sputum is, uh, it's very common with a specific type of patient. Uh, and we're gonna talk about that after we take a look at the 12 lead here. So here's the 12 lead I presented. And looking at this 12 lead, first you're gonna start by determining the rhythm. And it appears to be a sinus rhythm. Uh, your P waves, they're upright in all of these limb leads here. It's hard to tell in AVL, but probably upright and negative in AVR. That's common that it's hard to tell in AVL. I've seen that quite a bit. And the PR interval is normal, and there's a P wave for every QRS complex. So it's a sinus rhythm and maybe a little bit tachycardic. Okay, if you were to do the big box 300 rule, you'd see that it's faster than 100 beats a minute because there's, you know, not three of these big boxes between the R to R interval. So you know it's faster than 100, so it's a sinus tachycardia. And I teach that all sinus tachycardias should be proven or should be considered uh, compensatory unless proven otherwise. So if you have a patient that pre presents to you with sinus tachycardia, you got to think it's compensatory or anxiety induced. Looking for that this 12 lead, uh, we have a couple extra uh, beats here, you know, that premature beats. This one's obviously a atrial beat. It's got a P wave and that P wave itself uh, should tell you something. It's a big, tall peak T wave. You know, usually that's an indication of right atrial enlargement when you see it uh, in the limb leads with every QRS complex. And it, it's premature, it comes early cycle. And then you have another uh, premature beat here. Uh, and I believe there's a P wave because you can see one in V4, it looks like. So that's probably another PAC. Nothing to worry yourself about. Looking at the precordial, or I'm sorry, look, first looking at the frontal plane axis. So we're going to first look at the limb leads here. And we're going to determine uh, our QRS axis in the frontal plane. And it looks to be normal. Lead 1 is mostly positive. AVF is mostly positive. That's your quick quadrant rule. Okay, and then in the precordial axis, it looks to be maybe a little bit late R wave progression. You go from mostly negative to mostly positive uh, R wave progression here from V1 to V6, that's normal. But the transition should occur a little bit before V4. I mean, you have maybe an equiphasic and this premature complex is mostly negative uh, beat there. So you should consider this to be maybe a little bit of a late R wave progression, not too late, but a little late which we know can be an indication of an anterior wall MI. Um, so we're going to definitely look for that. Uh, looking for ST and T changes. ST and T changes. So we see some ST elevation over here in the right precordial leads. Uh, some ST elevation in the right precordial leads. Now we have to look for ST depression. And we do see some ST depression in the left precordial leads, uh, specifically V5 and V6. You definitely see some kind of drawn a lot here. Some uh, ST depression V5 and V6. Now, typically with an MI, you're going to have tall symmetrical T waves or uh, convex ST elevation. Now, looking at this ST elevation, we can't just call it a STEMI yet. We have to kind of get a better picture here. Uh, this ST elevation is concave up, so it's typically, let me try to draw, it's concave up, so this is typically not as bad. And the other thing that you notice is that the T waves are proportionate to the QRS complex. So the deeper the QRS complex, the bigger the T wave. And, and that's normal. Abnormal would be like with a STEMI, you'll have big, tall T waves with very small QRS complexes. That's not normal. You also notice something called T wave discordance. T wave discordance, where the last wave of the QRS complex 
If it's negative, the T wave is positive, and vice versa. If the last wave of the QRS complex is positive, as it is in V5 and V6, the T wave is negative. Now what may happen with T wave discordance is you get kind of a stretching of the ST segment if you have very deep or very tall QRS complexes. And you happen to have that here. You can see that from V1 to V3, uh, your QRS complexes, they're cut off on the bottom. You see how it's flattened out on the bottom? The heart doesn't cause that. The monitor does that. Uh, it depends on the monitor. This is a Zoll uh, M series, I believe, monitor. And it will cut off the QRS complex before it interferes with the you know, uh, neighboring lead. It makes you know, interpretation better because it doesn't uh, actually interfere with you know, what you're trying to see there. But it doesn't really tell you how deep those QRS complexes really are. And those are pretty deep QRS complexes. And over here in V5 and V6, you can see that you have relatively tall QRS complexes. Now, I'm not going to tell you that you need to add up the tall or the deepest S wave in V1 and V2 uh, with the tallest R wave in V5 and V6, because that 35 millimeter rule, if, now that, that's the rule if you don't know, if you add those together and you have greater than 35 millimeters, it's considered to be LVH, you know, uh, determined by a 12 lead EKG. But this cuts off the QRS complexes. So you can assume that this is uh, very, very deep QRS complexes in V1 through V3 and very tall, uh, at least in V6. So this is probably a left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, you may be thinking, well, the QRS complex looks like it may be a little bit wide. Some would look at lead one, okay, and say that looks a little bit wide. And it is right on the edge of normal. It is right on the edge of normal. And if this were a wide QRS complex, this certainly would fit the left bundle branch block pattern. But I'm going to tell you right now, it's not that important to differentiate between LVH and left bundle branch block because they both present with the same thing, left ventricular strain, left ventricular strain. And left ventricular strain will cause ST elevation in the left, or I'm sorry, the right precordial leads, and it can cause ST depression in the left precordial leads. So basically every lead where the T wave is positive, it will cause ST elevation, left ventricular strain will. So this 12 lead here um, is indicative of a left ventricular strain pattern, and we don't have any sign of acute myocardial infarction. So this ST elevation, it's all concave up, it's proportionate to the depth of the preceding S wave, which is normal with a left ventricular strain pattern. There's no convex ST elevation. You know the big tombstone uh, convex ST elevation. Let me see if I can draw it here. You know, if you had ST elevation that looked something like that, that would be a little bit more concerning. If you can't see it, it's on the bottom here. Uh, that would be more concerning. That would be convex ST elevation. You don't have any ST elevation in leads where the T wave is negative. So if you had ST elevation in V5 or V6, that would be very concerning, okay? That would be concordant ST elevation. Discordant ST elevation with left ventricular strain pattern is not that concerning. And I'm gonna go on a limb here and say that you can use Scarbosa's criteria. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, check out Dr. Smith's ECG blog. You can just Google Dr. Smith's ECG blog or the EMS 12 lead blog. It's, I believe it's ems12lead.com. Tom Boothelet and Dr. Stephen Smith talk about it a lot. It's called Scarbosa's criteria. And it's actually a set of rules that you can use for determining a MI in the presence of left bundle branch block or a paced rhythm. And the reason those rules are so good is because it looks at excessive discordance. It knows that this thing right here in, in these right precordial leads, that's normal. But if we had ST elevation uh, that was you know 20 to 25% more of the depth of the S wave, that would be abnormal. Or if we had any concordant ST elevation, if the ST elevation went in the same direction as the R wave, that would also be abnormal, which would indicate an MI. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that you could use Scarbosa's criteria not only for left bundle branch block and paced rhythms, but also for LVH with a strain pattern because of the same rules. I mean, you have the same pattern here as you would with a left bundle branch block. So this is not a STEMI. It was called a STEMI alert uh, by the crew and then downgraded by the cardiologist. This type of patient that's going to have a, a hypertrophied left ventricle, which just means it's enlarged, is the heart failure patient. The patient with 
congestive heart failure is going to have uh, an LVH show up on their 12 EDKG very, very often, along with left atrial enlargement or right atrial enlargement, left ventricular hypertrophy, very, very common with the congestive heart failure patient. So that pink frothy sputum, the shortness of breath, you got to then kind of get more information, get a blood pressure on your patient, get some lung sounds, identify whether they're having a CHF exacerbation, and then treat from there. If you're not familiar with the left ventricular strain pattern, I've mentioned it before in a previous ECG case, and I'm going to put a link on there if you're on YouTube, go check that one out, and I'll, uh, I explain it a little bit better in that ECG case as well. Here's the EKG resource for uh, this case. I would like you to definitely check out this book. 12 Lead ECG, The Art of Interpretations by Thomas Garcia and Neil Holtz. Um, and it is a phenomenal book. It is probably the most comprehensive 12 Lead EKG book I've ever read that could take you from beginner to advanced if you read it from cover to cover, which I have a few times. And I definitely have to uh, give big props to uh, the 12 Lead e e ECG, The Art of Interpretation book. Um, it's also... Uh, one of Tom Boutelet's favorite books. If you're familiar with Tom Boutelet's blog, he talks about this book all the time. So that's it for uh, this case. If you have any questions at all, or if you want to send me some interesting 12-week cases, or you know, just talk EKG with me, send me an email over to paramedicine101 at gmail.com. Make sure you subscribe to uh, the YouTube channel, and check back for the next video. See you till then.